Hello and welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. Today we are joined by Brent McComas. He's the guy behind Target Walleye, the email, the website, you name it, it's out there. Brett, how you doing today? Good, buddy. How you doing? I am doing wonderful. I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. And the reason you're on the show is I got your email and I saw the video about Lake Winnipeg and a Yeti fish house. And I'm like, that's something you don't see very often. I've had the Brewer Agri guys on the show uh, talking some Lake Winnipeg before, but they really do a, uh, you know, it's a run and gun style type of fishing. And that's when you think Winnipeg, that's what you think of. But you guys were up there in a wheelhouse. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, that was new to me, too. I've been up to Winnipeg numerous times. First time ever staying on the ice. Really, first time ever staying put and not doing the the run and gun and a whole hopping thing. And I've been following this guy on Instagram for years. His name was Chris Gunn. And immediately caught my attention when he posted a picture of a big greenback walleye. And it was in a wheelhouse. And you just don't see that. And so I immediately started following him. And, uh, you know, I'm just like, one day I am going up there and linking up with him. And I have to experience that because one wheelhouse life doesn't get any better. Combine a shot at a 10 pound greenback and I'm in. And uh, that dude is dialed. He's got the ski systems for the wheels, big old track machine. I think he's got three fish houses now. Baja him out there and, uh, yeah, the bite was phenomenal, and being able to cook some steaks, cook burgers, fry fish, and be there for those the early, early morning bite when it's still like dark out, kind of twilight and evening, and we even caught fish after dark. One of the first nights, it was just coming off of a full moon, and we had rattle reels dinging at night. One of our best bite windows was like 11 p.m. when people are long gone off the lake, and you just don't hear a lot about that and uh yeah i guess trying to get the word out about it now that i've experienced it i wanted to wait until i got up there and got to try it <laughs> right <laughs> tell too many people but it was wild you know what what's kind of the wheelhouse culture up there because again we just don't don't hear about lake winnipeg in a wheelhouse um how many wheelhouses do you see out there is <laughs> you know i mean there's a, a couple of uh the kind of homemade uh diy shanties or whatever little permanent skid houses but it's just the ice travel is so difficult Mm -hmm. you don't see people just hooking up pulling a fish house with their truck out there you got to have the track machine you got to have the skis for them i mean just big ticket items that a lot of people don't have access to but some people are starting to and uh yeah i mean we well the first two days we barely saw another human being it was 40 mile per hour winds and on that lake just that south basin is 40 to 50 miles across so you might be like i can get around anywhere i want in my truck and three minutes later you're buried (laughs) because you've got a 40 mile per hour wind blowing any snow on that side of the lake all the way across and uh actually all the days we were there chris uh was getting calls and texts and going on rescue missions pulling out people who were stuck in snow bears and then suburbans and just whatever and I I was feeling kind of guilty because I'm sitting on a leather couch with a 50 inch tv with a live scope hooked up to it fireplace cooking (laughs) crushing coffee and uh catching greenbacks and remember I went outside to fill the generator up and I didn't even realize it was 40 mile per hour winds because I hadn't been outside yet. And I'm like, man, am I thankful to be in here. Yeah, it, it can get nasty out there. Tell us a little bit about what it's like right now. I mean, you, you're you from the Brainerd area uh, to get out to Winnipeg. What's the kind of travel conditions like and what's that border crossing like right now? You know, I haven't been up there in a few years now. It was my first trip back up and it had me a little nervous just uh it couldn't have gone any smoother the border crossing was a 30 second thing for me roads were smooth traveling i think it was about seven hours for me to get from brainerd to the access where we were fishing it was like six ish hours to get up to uh selkirk where we stayed on the way up um, which is just 30 minutes north of winnipeg and uh yeah i just it made me think why don't i do this more often you know it's just it's just far enough that you think it's this big ordeal, but it's also just close enough that it's like you could 
zip up there after work on a Friday, you know, and you'd get up there late, but you'd be up there. And I don't know, in my head, I just was always remembering it as like this 10, 12 hour trek, got to spend a whole day and it's really not that bad. It's not that far. And to have a shot at the, the fish of a lifetime is incredible, but yeah, border crossing went smooth. Everything went smooth. I just made sure I didn't bring any potatoes or, <laughs> or my own bait or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So you guys get up there, um, you, you get up there in the evening and, and right away you're up there with Nick Linder, by the way. And, and it, the video is on the Target Walleye YouTube channel if you want to go check it out if you don't subscribe to the email. But if you don't subscribe to the email, you really should. We'll, we'll just throw that in there for you. But you guys, I mean, Nick bangs a huge one right off the bat, right when you guys get going. I can't even – I'm still speechless about that. I didn't even catch it. And in that moment, I'm like, this trip is set. I'm good. It was uh, – we actually met him at the Access at, like, 6 30 a.m and got an early start that day and we're unloading gear literally don't even have gear put away yet but he already had you know house warm holes open live scope on and we're setting gear down and it's like there's two fish on the graph there's three there's one look at the size of that one it's like maybe we should take a little break from putting gear away uh because you know there's obviously fish crawling around all over the place and uh so we went and dug out the rods out of the, the rod case. And uh, yeah, sure enough, I was still just grabbing. I think I was walking in the fish house with some fish batter. Just, you know, that's high hopes. I'm already thinking about cooking fish when we haven't fished yet. And I see, I step into the house and I see this giant mark getting vertical. Like normally they're swimming like this and it's like this. And I'm looking going, what's going on? And then I realize Nick's rattle bait is right here. And this thing is just vertical on him. He sets the hook, rod stops. And I'm just, is this real life? You know, because it wasn't just, he set the hook and a walleye comes flying up. It's setting the hook into a rock. And it was his first 30 incher. We weighed it quick. It was 11.55 pounds and that beautiful green hue. And it was so funny because on the drive up, Nick was like, man, I, it was just to catch that first 30. I've never caught a 30. And it's the first thing everybody asks you, you know, and it's always, you haven't caught a 30 inch walleye, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, well, yeah, you got a shot at it. But, uh, I mean, I've been going up there for many years, and I haven't had a 30 up there. You get 28s and whatever, huge fish. And, yeah, I mean, he was fishing for five minutes and caught that thing. And unbelievable. You just can't even make it up. Luckily, we had a couple of GoPros set up because we've learned that uh, if you don't do that first, you, you're going to miss something crazy. always happens instantly on every trip. So you guys had the big 30, but let's let's talk a little bit about the size structure. You said, you know, you can go out in, in the 28s, you know, you can catch those. Um, but what about eater fish? Are you guys able to get into some eater fish as well? Yeah, uh, I would say half the fish we caught were perfect eaters. And there right now, if you have a normal license, you can keep six fish, but only one can be over X centimeters. And I think it translated to like 21 point something inches. And I'd say half the fish we caught were just great, you know, that 18 inch eater range. And the other half of the fish we caught, there's a, a huge year class, at least in the spot we were in, of like 22 and a half to 23 inches. And up there, that's a four pound fish. They're this big around. And uh, I would say probably half or even better of the fish we caught were just those beast that just fights so hard and you, you don't know if it's a 27 or what it, it just it's incredible and uh yeah then you always have a shot at a big one i got one that we didn't really measure it we were kind of in a, a hustle it was flirting with that master angler size like a 28 i should have weighed it really it was so fat it could have been a 10 pounder but you're like oh it's not a 30 you know everybody gets that 30 number in their head it's got to be a 30 well i got a fish on the wall i don't know if you can see it that was my first 30 incher it probably didn't even weigh seven pounds you know and up there you can catch a 27 incher that weighs more than that <laughs> and are just the, the fish of a lifetime but yeah we were able to to get some or plenty of eaters and did a couple of fish fries and it's uh it's kind of cool you catch enough of those big fish that at one point, we're kind of getting excited, like, oh, yeah, there's another, you know, 17 or 18 inch, boom, back-to-back -back fish tacos. 
So a really nice mixture of size range. We got everything from that to 30 and uh, just kind of all different classes in between. But that number of 23 inches in there right now is, is pretty wild. Tell me a little bit about that night bite. Again, that's not something that most people experience. Uh, what, what was the night bite like out there? Yeah, every day was a little different. Uh, there was one night where I don't think we really caught anything after dark. There was another night where our best bite window was, was 10, 11 o'clock. We were still graphing big fish, 12, 1. Um, it was kind of weird how every single night was different. And I'm so used to around the central Minnesota area, you can get it dialed down to the minute of, you know, 30 minutes of sun, sunrise, sunset. And if you're doing that after dark bite, it's like, okay, from nine to nine 45, I'm going to have a window and catch one or whatever. So it was kind of weird how every single day the bite window was different for both daytime and nighttime. Um, but yeah, we, we, would stay up as late as we could if we were still graphing fish and he, uh, catching them on rattle baits. And it slowed down a little bit as far as their mood. And so finally we uh, set some rattle reels and uh, it's so weird catching fish on barbless hooks on a rattle reel after dark, <laughs> but you really don't lose many. I, I, we just ended up doing a, a number four and number six treble hook. Barb's pinched with a mud minnow or dace, which is basically all you can find for live bait up there. And that's fine by me. If you ever if you've ever fished with a mud minnow, it's like that thing will sit there and kick for four days. I wish I could get him around here and just hook him through the the top of the back or the tail on that treble hook. And uh, I was running twenty pound rattle reel line on those uh, catch cover rattlesnake reels. I did a fourteen pound floral leader because I wanted to have a little a little oomph um, since the drag is your hand. Yeah. And yeah, I don't think there was maybe one or two fish where I missed on the hook set and they probably had already dropped it, but never had any fish come off uh, while fighting them or whatever. And it's just, you know, you think barbless, oh man, you know, I already lose walleyes all the time. Now what? I don't think there was ever a, a fish on that trip that we lost because of barbless either. Nice. Tell me a little bit about the structure you guys are fishing. Or are you just fishing a flat? How deep a water? Yeah, it's it reminds me of uh, Manitoba's version of Red Lake, but bigger fish, bigger water. <laughs> you know, it's just a real gradual break. We were in about 10 feet of water, which is uh, a little bit shallow. A lot of people fish out in that 12-foot stuff. Um, but I guess they've been having a really good shallow bite all year. And basically, you're looking for uh, kind of areas that are holding the most fish. It's it's kind of like Red Lake, where if you're drilling holes, not seeing fish, go a quarter mile or a half mile, drill another hole, and you're looking for these kind of areas holding these pods of fish. And I didn't have to do any of that on this trip. It was glorious. Chris did all the hard work. <laughs> so that was kind of a nice change of pace. But uh, yeah, so we were in like 10 feet of water. It was kind of a silty, muddy bottom, I would say. And most everyone up there right now is focusing on the mouths of creeks and rivers. Uh, this late ice period, these fish are super fat. Actually, that 30 inch, you could actually see eggs coming out of it when we were releasing it um, after a couple quick photos. So these fish are getting ready for the spawn and they're moving from the main Lake Winnipeg basin and pushing to that south end where the Red River dumps in. And it's just a annual migration and they call it march madness up there and uh you know soon they'll be catching them from the boat in the red river but right now it just kind of congregates fish that are roaming that that massive body of water i mean there's tons of fish out in that 20 20 foot plus stuff that never see a bait never see a person because to stay on them you'd have to be you know one dude with a live unit scanning and run and gun and run and gun i mean you could be rewarded for that for sure but you start getting the melt start getting fish moving migrating down to those uh those rivers and stuff that dump in and even if it's just a little creek with some moving water it's uh it just kind of helps narrow the search then you can set up shop in a hub house or in a wheelhouse and kind of wait for them to come to you and yeah, one of the things i saw there is you guys seem to be fishing some pretty aggressive fish and I was watching, you talk about those walleyes going vertical. I mean, I was yeah. watching walleyes go vertical and chasing your bait basically all the way up the water column. 
That is something that I have not seen very many places. Literally, they get vertical coming up. And it wasn't always like that. I mean, I showed some of the coolest interactions of the fish. We definitely had days and times where they were a walleye. You know, they were tighter to bottom. They were slowly coming in. If you hit the rattle bait, they turn around and go the other way. There's a couple of different moods of fish, and it depended on the day. So we always had a rattle reel down. And uh, it's just funny how some of those fish would come in and they could care less about the rattle bait they'd go straight for that minnow and take off and boom bonus catch and some of them you couldn't jig hard enough they wouldn't they could care less about a live minnow on a plain hook with fluorocarbon leader they'd swim right past it to go to something that's moving and bright and gaudy so it just it's funny how it changed hour by hour and day by day of what they wanted um, there was really good bite windows, and there's times where you go a couple hours and you get turned down a few times. So we were just constantly changing baits, playing with stuff. That rattle bait bite is obviously by far my favorite. <laughs> you know, it's just the, the rattle bait capital of the world for walleyes, for ice fishing. And so I always tend to start there and then work backwards if I get turned down and go into a lipless crankbait that doesn't have rattles to see how they react to that. And that's kind of like, like a slab wrap type. It reminds me of a jigging wrap, rip and wrap hybrid. It's silent, but still has a little vibration. And if they eat that, I stick with it. If I get turned down on that, then I go to the jigging spoons. But the nice thing with, you know, having that rattle reel down is you can keep the, the big fun stuff in your hand longer, knowing that you got that backup plan. Yeah. You told me a little bit about your setup on your rattle reels. Uh, tell me about the rods and lines and, and things you're using on your jigging rods. Yeah, I beefed everything up going up there. Uh, I was either using a 38-inch tuned-up custom rods Vulcan, which is a big, meaty, big fish, predator fish rod. And it's a glass rod, lots of shock absorber, but also has backbone. And I was running mono on both setups, 10-pound on that one, because I want a little bit of that stretch in the system. Between the rod being that glass mod fast action and uh, mono line, Having that shock absorber was super nice because you're in shallow water with big fish and barbless hooks. So you need something in the system to give a little bit, but you need to keep constant pressure because the second that you lose that pressure is when they can throw the hooks. So I really liked having that Vulcan in my hand because I was in control. I could tell the fish which way it was going to go. And you'll see on those live scope clips how fast I get those fish right up to the hole. If you wait a second longer, that's where you get into trouble. As soon as they start getting, you know, perpendicular to the hole and you can't get their head turned up because it's so shallow, that's where you lose all your fish with barbless hooks because you just can't get them turned up with that steep angle. So I was, uh, and I was leaning into them and getting them up. But if I was using smaller baits like the slab wraps or number six ripping wraps or spoons, and I was using a tuned up custom rods commander, and that's, you know, by Minnesota standards, a really beefy rod. But uh, it's a, a notch down from that Vulcan, but extra fast, medium heavy. I mean, you got you got power, and uh, that's because you, you never know if it's going to be a 33 incher that weighs 14 pounds or an 18 inch eater. So I just bumped everything up on that setup. But my lighter setup, I had eight pound mono, and I still did a 10 or 12 pound fluorocarbon leader, um, just because I like that little stiffer leader. The baits follow less. And if you get in that situation where they're kind of in the hole or you're trying to turn them, having that little beefier fluorocarbon leader is just some nice insurance. I'll actually use that little swivel as kind of a, a point to hold on to when I'm trying to get them turned up or trying to like, you know, slide them into your hand to land them because they come up so hot. I mean, if you get them up in the hole in 10 feet of water in a couple seconds, it's like then they realize they're hooked and the fight is on. So it came back and hands were just all <laughs> gnarly <laughs> using lots of super glue. Yeah. So, you know, you talked about Minnesota and it's something like it would drive me nuts when I hunt is when people go out West during the rut here, and it's like you're leaving on your trip when the hunt is really good here. And the cool thing about this trip is, you know, Minnesota in March, you know, you really, you're going to be hard pressed to find a place you can go catch walleyes. So you guys left at a time to go chase these big walleyes when you can't do it in Minnesota. Talk about that timing and just yeah. how, how that works out for you. The only thing that had me even a little bit hesitant 
was it the bourbon spawn was in full go the daytime bite and i block that off of my calendar every year i don't want to be anywhere but there so that's why we chose where we did or when we did too because the week prior was kind of like the best bourbon bite but yeah with the rest of the game fish season being closed as of whatever it was february 26 it's like what other options do you have if you want to set the hook and and catch a fish that fights back you know you can sneak out and do some bourbon fishing chase panfish or drive seven hours and catch a new personal best walleye through four feet of ice <laughs> so it's it's really cool and the bike gets i mean really good up there in march the march madness thing with all the fish starting to push towards the uh the creek mouth and river mouth and uh so it's just kind of like a double whammy our seasons are closed theirs are open and the, and the fishing's just getting better and the weather's getting better but to be fair they catch plenty of fish in january too so mm-hmm. you know and even february you just might not be doing the rattle bait thing you might be doing more spoons but slow fishing by uh manitoba standards is is pretty pretty good <laughs> If you're just a junkie for it and, and you want to go out and do it right now, and that just seemed to be like a really good idea to get out there, experience something different, and and really experience some world class fishing. Uh, one of the things I saw in the video a few different times, uh, you're wrestling fish and the laptops up on the countertop. Um, so are you doing work while you're out there? I was. I could not believe he actually had Wi Fi. <laughs> he's got something called Starlink in one of his houses and something else similar in the other one. And, uh, it, it was insane. I was not prepared for that and I couldn't have been more thankful because, uh, yeah, to get some work done, but it was kind of hard because I think my biggest fish of the trip, I was actually working on a target walleye email, kept, you know, distracted watching the big screen and see this little flicker on bottom that looked like just a minnow or something. But just in case I, you know, slid the laptop over on the table, brought the rod around and shook the rattle bait a few times. And then what do you know, the little uh, minnow all of a sudden starts getting this big. <laughs> it's like, that was middle of the day, catch a 27, 28 inch, whatever, like a 10 pound walleye while working on the computer <laughs> hooked up to Wi-Fi. Like, man, I, uh, I could just do this every day. That should just be, you know, that's a way better office than this one. All right. Uh, look like you guys were eating pretty good out there too. Uh, tell me about some of the meals. Oh, ridiculous. So Chris is a heck of a cook and he did an incredible fish fry. He's, uh, got a buddy who owns a barbecue shop. I I can't remember what it's called. I need to look it up. It's called big smoke, I think. Um, but he had burnt ends and like all these sides and he has them in these bags that you just boil. So they're like, you you boil a pot of water, put these burnt ends in a bag and let them soak in that boiling water for 20 minutes. And you'd swear they just came off the smoker after 12 hours on there. So that was a real special treat and really opened my eyes to, uh, you know, the ease of, of meals <laughs> can have burnt ends and all you got to do is boil water and you don't have to clean up a pan or anything instead but i mean we also had to throw a couple of big one pound ribeyes on there that's kind of like a a wheelhouse tradition for me and uh burgers bacon and eggs in the morning i mean we came back a lot heavier than when we left for this trip so they put those bumper stickers on the back of those wheelhouses that say heavier out yes exactly (laughs) it's got to be one of the reasons yeah there you go um the other thing I wanted to ask you about is the video is pretty much shot, you know, it's starring you. So, you know, you don't have a whole lot of Nick in there. Is there another version coming out that's uh, got some Nick in it? Yeah, he probably got more fish than I did. But, yeah, he's going to have his own video, and that's why you just saw a little preview of that 30-incher. I didn't want to steal all his limelight with the fights and the hook sets. But, yeah, he uh, – actually, when he caught that 30 – within 10 minutes after that he also caught like a 24 25 incher 23 it was just boom 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 so uh yeah he's gonna have another uh video coming out of a bunch of his catches and actually i've got a couple more coming out that was just one of the days cool. so another one of the days in the next video i'll be posting it was a little bit tougher bite and that's when we had to switch up tactics and get rid of uh get rid of some rattles for for part of the day so you'll see that one coming next very cool. Well, Brett, 
Appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, is there something that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you about today? No, nah, Chris, I just really appreciate the opportunity to chat fishing. And I mean, time flies when we do. It's always good to to chat with you. And I, I watch all the podcasts. And, uh, and when you reached out, I mean, I'd, I'd jump on here in a heartbeat anytime to chat fishing with you, buddy. <laughs> awesome, man. I appreciate it. Hey, do you need a new coffee maker? <laughs> you did watch the video till the end. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's what happens when you have a 50 inch TV with a live scope hooked up to it. I put the French press lid on my little, uh, you know, flash pot deal because I didn't want to go boil water. And and he has a Keurig in there, actually. So I could have just done that and pressed a button, but I wanted to be fancy and use my little flash cooker. And I forgot to turn it off. I put the French press in there and put the lid on. And all of a sudden got distracted by the big screen, left that thing ripping with the lid on, and yeah, boom. So went through a whole roll of paper towels, and uh, I made sure I wiped off all the fish house walls and stuff before I even wiped off, like, my computer and cameras and every everything. <laughs> Just yeah, the things that happen. You press explode, you got to check out this video. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's it's funny. We're all in the wheelhouse world. We We love our French press coffee, and... Yes. Remember when I first bought it, my wife's like, well, why don't you make me French breast coffee at home? <laughs> you have to go fishing to get it, I guess. Yeah, no, it's another, it's like a special treat. It's like I was saying I'd bring steaks out to the wheelhouse for one night every time. You got to do the French press or, uh, you know, whatever, that kind of feel manly making my coffee in a way that doesn't have a filter or whatever. Right. <laughs> Good stuff. Well, Brett McComas from Target Walleye, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it, and uh, good luck. I know the season's kind of ticking down here, but uh, good luck the rest of the way. Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. I really appreciate it.